Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash, which is of course a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma. And in this video we are going to be starting my long-awaited in-depth series on the Soul Blight Grave Lords, which similar to my series on the Night Haunt, Flesh Eater Courts, Osiarch Bone Reapers, Maggot King of Nurgle, Gloom Spy Gits, Beasts of Chaos, Slaves to Darkness, and more, which you can check out on my channel. This will be the most in-depth army series on YouTube, where like the other armies I have done, it will be about 10 to 20 hours of content for you lovely people leaving no stone unturned when we go into this big army series for the Soul Blight Gravelords. And if you want to get a head start on it, check out my Why Play Soul Blight Gravelords video I did in the meantime with the great Alex Tubbs where we looked at the strengths and weaknesses of the Soul Blight Gravelords to really nail down to see if it is an army you would like to play. But in this video we will be staking things off with the lore of the Soul Blight Gravelords just to make sure you know why these bloodsuckers are really cool before we look at all their rules and so much depth. As this will be an overall video on the Soul Blight Gravelord's lore, if you would like me to do lore videos on specific parts of the army, such as characters, locations, places, dynasties, legions, etc., let me know that in the comments. And as always, if you do enjoy this video, please smash the like button and the subscribe button and the bell notification. And if you could be absolutely awesome, please consider supporting me here on YouTube where you can become a member here. You see a join button, press it, or there's a link to my Patreon at the top of the description down below if you would be so kind. And also, if you think you know someone else who would enjoy this video, make sure you share it with them and hopefully they love vampires that little bit more when we're done. And just the last thing I want to say with this video is that like my lore videos for my armies for the last few, like Slays of Darkness, Beasts of Chaos, etc., I have got about 3,000 words of notes for the lore of this video. So if you do enjoy the video, this video has taken an extra long amount of time to produce. So if you could smash that like button, that would be amazing. And hopefully it will all be worth it. And we're going to start by saying, firstly, what does Soul Blight actually mean? Well, it means vampires. And for the most part, the traditional vampire that we all know and love. The Soul Blight Grave Lords were the legions of Nagash, and before that, they were the vampire counts of old. So they have had a fair few rebrands over their time and over the years. As the vampire counts were from the Warhammer Fantasy Battles and the Old World, then when Age of Sigma came along, they were under Grand Alliance death for those old enough Age of Sigma to remember that. And they were there for a couple of years before the forces of death were broken up and the majority of the Vampire Count models and units became Legions of Nagash, which I found fun at the time as it allowed me to finally play with my huge collection of um, death models with some sort of synergy rather than putting an armist together and hoping for the best, because the one thing you had was the death save and that was pretty much the most synergy in the army. However, the Legions of Nagash Battletome was always really a gap filler, which brings us to where we are now with the Soul Blight Grave Lords, which feels like not just an expansion of Legions of Nagash, but instead its own proper army set in Age of Sigma. So if you like the forces of death with vampires, skeletons, zombies, vampire bats, and monstrosities, there has never been a better time to start. And I love it as I love the whole Vampire Count aesthetic, theme, lore, and everything else to do with them. And this feels like the most traditional army we have had for them in Age of Sigma, with it all feeling like it synergizes well together. I know some people in this army first came out, they were like, oh, I just wanted it all to be a vampire army. I don't want it to be the whole Vampire Count thing again. Personally, I love the Vampire Count style, so that's my opinion. And then secondly, you can make an all-vampire count army in here anyway, with loads of blood knights and everything else, so I don't know why you would complain. But each to their own at the end of the day. Okay, so now that we've established what Soul Black Gravelord are in terms of their rebranding of their name and everything else, let's get a bit more further down into the story. So, firstly, what is a vampire and why are they called Soul Blight? Well, vampires are not natural creatures. No one is born a vampire, and to become such a creature you must be given this gift by an existing vampire. This gift has many names across the mortal realms, such as the Twilight Change, the Helsin's Mark, 
the Drakkar Descent, but most commonly known as the Blood Kiss. This is what turns a mortal human into a vampire. Some vampire bloodlines take great care and planning when it comes to considering giving someone the blood kiss and giving them the honour of joining their great dynasty. While sometimes the blood kisses have been used in espionage or even in the heat of combat, whatever the way the transformation is given, most of vampires are not as powerful as the vampire that came before them, which means the older the vampire the more powerful they are in most cases. And the existence of vampires originates from Nagash, but not directly. For we go back to the world that was where Nagash, who was the first human necromancer who learned the magical art of necromancy from captured Dark Elves, had a certain admirer whose name was Neferata of Lamia. She studied the great necromancer's work not out of servitude, but out of determination to make herself immortal without turning herself into some sort of colossal skeleton monstrosity. She part succeeded in this by creating an elixir that gave her all that she craved, but with this came a new craving. For the taste of mortal blood, and thus Neferata became the first vampire and all other vampires can trace their blood back to her. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, there is a huge amount of lore I could talk about at this fascinating point in Warhammer Fantasy history, but now we have to move to the present day as this is not a Warhammer Fantasy lore video. But in today's day, all vampires can directly trace themselves back to three main vampires, which is Neferata Manfred von Karstein, yep, that guy, who was another vampire from the Old World, and Usharan, the father of the Flesh Eater Courts. Now, I may have pronounced the last one wrong, but if I did so, that's just how it is now to be spoken in my part of Shaiish, so that is the reason for that. And now that we know the history of the origins of the vampires, and how one becomes one, what exactly does it mean to be a vampire? Right, you're trying to be sold on this, you're not really too sure, you're a bit on the fence. So, you will become immortal, incredibly strong, and capable of things mere mortals could only dream of. And although becoming a vampire does not make you instantly more intelligent than you were in your previous human life, it does mention that you are immortal. That is a very key point I am trying to sell to you. Which does mean you have in theory until the end of time or until your head is removed from your body to study and learn the knowledge available in the mortal realms. Which if you consider in our world what some of the smartest people could achieve in a mere lifetime of let's say 80 years, what could a vampire who has been alive for 900 years achieve? It makes you think, doesn't it? And also it is worth mentioning that becoming a vampire does not necessarily make you evil. You are still for the most part the same personality with the same morals and ethics for better or for some unfortunate cases, definitely a lot worse. And although no matter how good of a soul you have, you will soon more than likely grow, shall we say, superiority over humans, as you are literally consuming their blood and actually eating them on a daily basis. Which brings us to why they are called the Soul Blight for GWIP purposes. It is very much a well descriptive name as by becoming a vampire, your soul becomes blighted by a curse. For although you now have all of these great abilities, you now have a fair few side effects, unfortunately. So, of course the main one being needed to feast on the living by drinking their blood. And many soul blight societies, kingdoms, empires and nations have a supply network set up where a lot of their citizens are humans and are allowed to live within vampire lands. However, I mentioned they are there for supply reasons, and that's just it. Why go through the effort of hunting and taking, you know, the whole tracker hunting thing 
of humans when you can just have them part of your society and work them to the bone and give them a sense of worth while sucking the life force out of them. But where is the escapism in that fiction for us humans? There's plenty of that in the real world as it is, and it's not very imaginative. And on the subject of blood drinking, a well blood hydrated vampire is a happy vampire and could in most cases pass as a human if needed in the right lighting. But I hear you ask, what happens if a vampire stops drinking blood? And then this is where the physical part of the soul blight curse takes effect. As the vampire is no longer in full control of their soul, this new monstrous part of them will take over and they will no longer be able to pass as a human any longer. This can be a gradual change or a sudden change, turning the vampire into a true looking creature of the night. A good example of this are the Vargais within this army. The reason for their mutations to the physical form is for the vampire to be able to drink the blood it needs, or more likely in this case to just simply eat its victims. Trade in the finery and the beauty of a well hydrated vampire for the brutality of the strength of a monstrous creature such as a Vargeist. And because of this, most vampires see this as a horrible fate, in an almost similar way to how a champion of chaos could turn into a chaos spawn. The reason being is a lot of vampires are very very vain creatures and individuals, and like to see themselves as beautiful majestic beings, far more superior to humans, with no bad side effects or negatives attached to this lovely deal, and trying to hide from the light this soul blight curse they carry. So when their true nature takes over and turns them into this frenzy beast, you can see how this hurts their pride that they value very so much. But on the flip side of this, there are some vampires who see this as a natural form of evolution for them to become something different and stronger, as most of the time a normal vampire would not stand a chance against a Vargeist, or even a vampire lord stands very little chance against a Vengorian lord because these vampires do not see this as a curse at all, and fully embrace their new destiny. These vampires can often be found in the Vengorian dynasty as an example. And although that we've mentioned a lot about the physical side of the soul blight curse, it is only in fact half of it, for this is an arcane curse, which makes the vampire also a focal point for Shaishian death magic no matter what realm they are in. This is how vampires can use their will to dominate the dead, be it zombies, skeletons, geists and even creatures of the night, to make them serve and fight for their new master or mistress. Either through intent or unintentional, the dead never rest easy when close to a vampire. For example, a vampire who is passing through a town who has no intentions of causing a disturbance, may nevertheless, due to being a concentrated pool of death magic, cause the corpses and skeletal hands of the dead in the local graveyard to start scratching away at the inside of their coffins. The arcane power is not just limited to a mastery over the dead, but also used to increase the magical capabilities of the vampire making them a powerful wizard in death than they were in life. And actually, something that's quite interesting you might not have thought about is due to their dominating will, vampires actually have also been known to have hypnotic abilities over the humans, making them serve their needs and plans. An example of this is Neferata's blinding beauty, how she can enthrall mortals to do her bidding. And so now that we know what a vampire is, I think I pretty much explained to you everything there is to do with the soul blight curse in a sort of a summary version. 
Now we're going to talk about how do you actually kill a vampire in Warhammer Age of Sigma. As like I said, the vampires are very similar to most other fantasy settings, but all vampires are a little bit different, aren't they? Depending on what, you know, book they come from or fantasy lore or whatever. So how are they killable in the Age of Sigma? And for this, I thought I'd do an example. So imagine you, you lived in the mortal realms and you came home from work one day, you're really tired, you're exhausted, you're just hungry, you probably haven't eaten for a couple of days, you're working like a pit pony, but when you come home, you catch a vampire sleeping with your partner. So how would you kill this bastard? Well, as we discussed, vampires are pretty much immortal, so this is not going to be easy, and you would probably actually already be dead, but let's say the vampire is having a great time with your partner and is in no rush to finish early. You know, he's a vampire dedicated to Sinesh, let's say. So you have time to think this through. If you run up and stab the vampire anywhere that is in his head or the heart, he isn't going to care much about it. So your best options are to stake his heart by any means that involves stabbing his chest and piercing the heart itself. If you achieve this, somehow, the vampire will not be killed, but instead will be in a more paralysed state, where his undead body will no longer be able to function, and without being able to drink blood, the vampire will eventually turn into a sort of a husk type of corpse, but if you properly fed the blood back to the vampire again, from obviously, you know, mortals like we've been talking about, he could slowly return back to his powerful previous self. So basically, this would deal with the problem at the moment, but not really for long-term function, so just bear that in mind. So, your best bet is to cut its bloody head off, as although a vampire are incredibly good at regenerating, like we've talked about, they can't exactly grow back an entire body or grow the head back from the body. But then again, some of the most powerful vampires are able to block attacks that would mortally wound them due to the death magics within them, such as being crushed by a Moor Crusher. A vampire have some capabilities to just ignore that damage. Basically, with all this in mind, I'm not really fancying your chances. But another weakness associated with vampires is their vulnerability to sunlight. And although it is true that sunlight can hurt a vampire, and force them to suffer injury, it's very rarely that it can actually kill one. One such light that is capable so though, is the purest sunlight from Haish, the realm of light. You know, funny that, right? And because vampires are not really a fan of sunlight, like if it's not even going to kill them, they still don't like it, it's going to hurt and weaken them, vampires tend to sort of conjure up darkness, clouds to block out the light, or even just swarms of blood-sucking bats to keep them in the shade turning the land of the living into a land of darkness. And aside from the norm, there are some vampires that are able to withstand sunlight as well, such as the abhorrent ghoul kings of the Blisker Skin Grand Court from the Flesh Eater Courts. And I know that's a little bit of a side, you know, different army, but I just thought I'd mention it. Still a vampire at the end of the day. And yes, they do have some horrific sunburns, like honestly, I feel their pain as soon as it gets a little bit sunny and it's about 15 degrees Celsius plus outside. And with that, we have near enough covered pretty much everything there is to say about vampires in Age of Sigma, without going into specifics, like I mentioned. And with that, how are they actually organised in the Soulblight Gravelords? Unlike the vampire counts, they are not divided into certain bloodlines, but instead for the most part legions and dynasties, with legions being the most powerful, followed by dynasties. Now why are they split into legions and dynasties and not bloodlines? Because that's all we sort of like, if you've been around for a little while, that's what we've come to know with the vampires, and even if you don't know why I'm a fantasy that much, you know, bloodlines does kind of make sense for vampires rather than maybe legions, you would think. And the reason for why I believe they've done this is basically because dynasties and legions allow for more um, creativity and possibilities, I think, when you're creating your own lore, as there could be multiple bloodlines within a dynasty or a legion. This allows for a more united and less narrow-minded advancement for the Soulblight Gravelords. With this being said, you can, of course, in your own lore, for your army, 
have your vampires from a Pacific bloodline or dynasty and they don't like any other blood, you know, they're all mudbloods them or whatever you want to do. They want to stick to themselves and keep themselves pure blood. So if you want Slytherin vampires, there you go. And all you have to do for the purposes, if you do want to make your own a law for your own legion or, you know, dynasty, bloodline, whatever you want to do, like we just said, all you have to do is just make sure it fits into one of the dynasties or legions that they give you options for in the book. So there's five to choose from and then you just pick the rules for whatever you feel like fits your law the best. The same could be said for any other army with sub allegiances where you just pick a sub allegiance that fits your own law the most. But talking about the legions and dynasties, we're going to talk about the five ones you get in the book and the five main ones in the law. And the first one is going to be the Legion of Blood, led by Neferata, the Mortark of Blood, funny enough. Which is a force used by Nagash as a scalpel, as it specialises in espionage to beguile the enemy before mortal wounding them, which makes them a perfect reflection of the Mortark who leads them. You know, they're not all about just getting in the fight and punching the enemy, they're very much if they can complete the task without actually having the battles, going to war and more like espionage and spy network and stuff through Neferata's servants. That is how they will achieve the job. And then you have the Legion of Night, led by Manfred von Karstein, arguably the most cunning of all the legions and dynasties, for Manfred has little to no honour and does not care how victory is achieved as long as he is the victor using tricks and ambushes to surround his unsuspecting enemies with limitless hordes of the undead. And the reason for why Nagash has entrusted his two main legions of the Soulbly Gravelords to Neferata and Manfred is because they are both characters of such strong will that they will hate each other and thrive on competition between the both of them to prove who is the greatest of all vampires in the mortal realms, and of course it's Neferata. And because they are so busy with this, they have no time to work on trying to overthrow Nagash and take his place. Now moving on to the dynasties, and we'll start with the Veerkos dynasty. And I do just want to say at this moment in time, because there's a bunch of new names, if I do get any of them wrong, I do wholesomely apologise to yourself and uh, please let me know in the comments if I get them wrong because honestly that's what makes me not be able to sleep at night by people not telling me how to pronounce words. So if you could do that for me, that'd be fantastic. But moving on. So, the Veerkos dynasty, which perhaps is one of the strangest dynasties of them all, as they are all animalistic in nature and more so than most other vampires, for they are part beast in appearance themselves and not in the same way we discussed a vampire would turn if they were starved of blood. And they come originally from the dark and twisted frozen forests of Shaish. Now they are across the entire mortal realms, stalking their prey and wanting to turn the realms themselves into an endless hunting ground of the night. And then we move on to the Castellay dynasty, which is in quite strong contrast, because it is an order of vampires which values martial prowess above all else, and they are essentially the new blood dragon bloodline for Age of Sigma. They even dedicate their entire immortality to become the best warriors among all vampires. With this comes a sense of honour attached to it though, as they will not just simply slaughter defenceless villagers if they can help it, as they are not seen as worthy prey. They want to hunt the most powerful enemies they can find to prove their strength to their order and drink in only from the strongest of blood. And it kind of reminds me a little bit like Predator from, you know, Predator the film. And not obviously in the sense of blood drinking, but in the sense of Predator will generally not attack anyone if they haven't got a weapon. Because it's not to do with their warrior culture, it's not honoured within that. So, then last but not least, we move on to the Avangori, who are the most monstrous out of all vampires. Well, unlike the rest of their kin, they embrace the mutations that came with the Soulblight curse 
seeing what most vampires are disgusted by as actually their greatest strength and a gift of what it means to be a vampire, which is why they contain the most monstrous creatures like zombie dragons, terrorgeist, vargeist within their dynasty. And they have forsaken the confines of castles, cities and towns with everything else that is associated with civilised society and instead live in the caves and dark places of the mortal realms. And I think that's actually quite interesting as it means that they probably have quite a bit of rivalry of things like, you know, Beasts of Chaos, uh, Cruel Boys, you know, those sort of places, Glooms by Gits, all these dark, you know, dank to a certain degree, you would imagine, these caves. Um, where these other races live. I imagine there's quite a bit of conflict there, so that adds a lot more to the narrative. You can have between your games, if your um, mate's got a Blues by Gits army, and you've got an Avangori heavy themed Solar Gravelord's army, they would be natural enemies, which I think is quite cool. And unlike the uh, Veikos, which we talked about, and we said they were quite animalistic, their bloodline is quite different within their dynasty, and that's why they're like that, rather than these Avangori who just accept these monstrous um, transformations to their body that comes with the Soul Blight curse. So it's not the same, there is some difference there. And like I said at the start, that this is just an overview of the lore, and particularly just a very quick overview of the lore for the sub-allegiances of the Soul Blight Gravelords. So let me know in the comments as always if you would like me to do more Pacific lore videos for each one, as that's something I can look into. And although we have spoken mainly in this video on just about vampires, they're not the only Grave Lords. So if you are sticking around, you're not really a fan of the vampire stuff, and you really want to go on the Necromancer White King bit, and you're still watching this video, this bit's for you, and it's significantly shorter. But there are entire Death Rattle Kingdoms made up of skeleton warriors, Grave Guard, and Black Knights, led and ruled by a White King. These could be standalone forces or are part of a legion or dynasty. This is a good example of how the reanimate dead can still have a will of their own and are not all just about being mindless drones for vampire overlords. Not every single skeleton is controlled by a evil necromancer or vampire etc. And when we come to said necromancers under the death mages of the Grave Lords, some of them can be that stereotype of an old man with an evil cloak and a staff and raising skeletons in your local graveyard to go and spook the locals, those sort of ones that you happen to see on models like the corpse car and the mortis engine. However, that is not always the case. And to a lot of people with Shaiish, necromancy is simply a part of tradition and not used for, you know, quote, evil means. A good example of this is a village from the book The Undying King, where people from an area of Shaiish must defend their land from an invading crusading army of the Maga King of Nurgle. And those people use necromancy as tradition, as when a member of their society dies, they strip them of their flesh and meat, as they see rotten flesh as a cruel fate. And once they have stripped their relative until just their skeleton remains, they resurrect them, and the new skeleton retains their memories from life and continues to be part of the society. For example, it would still live in the same house as its relatives and all that, and it seems so you know bizarre and different to obviously how our living society works, but what this does do is it shows a great example of how the dead and the living can coexist side by side as equals without one simply ruling the other. And although I said this in a sort of introducing a little bit of lore for the necromancers and death mages of the Sobo Grave Lords, remember what I said earlier that not all vampires are evil, you know, so just bear that in mind. So if you want to have a vampire sort of like a bit of a in a grey area or even, you know, fight for the forces of good if you like against chaos and everything else and he wants to rule his kingdom as nice as possible you know if you look at Ulfan Khan the cursed city and you'll want your one to be pretty much the opposite of that not just all just horribly ran by the you know vampiric overlords and treating the uh, living like cattle there are some vampires out there who fight for you know for the lack of a better word in this incredibly gray universe for the forces of good 
And obviously when I say that I mean fight for Nagash because he is the best goodest guy there is in the whole of Age of Sigma. And then on that note the last thing I want to say and touch on is that although the Soulblight Gravelords are intended to be loyal to Nagash, out of either respect or fear there are even some that are so foolish that they try to defy his unmatched will over undeath. More so now that Nagash has been weakened by his war with Teclis from the book Broken Realms Teclis. With Nagash and his legions of Ossiak Bone Reapers suffering heavy damage, some Soulblight Gravelords have taken this opportunity to expand their territories and boundaries, even fighting Nagash's own forces. And although this is a direct act of war, whereas on the other hand, sometimes there are loyal or maybe even just neutral forces to Nagash, such as a Death Rattle Kingdom, like we mentioned earlier. However, a legion of Nagash's Osiarch Bone Reapers may come across this kingdom, and as the Death Rattle are already dead and cannot reproduce like the Bone Reapers tend to do, they would rather have a farm of a living kingdom reaping their bones slowly throughout the years than reap them all now. But when it comes to Death Rattle, the Bow Reapers calculate that they should just break the Death Rattle Kingdom now and harvest their bones. As unfortunately for the Death Rattle, they no longer have the functions capability of being able to reproduce for the most part. So what this demonstrates is that Nagash is a straightforward logical thinker and will not hesitate to recycle those who were not a threat to him into something greater and something he can repurpose to a more magnificent extent. As we've already said, the Osirak Bone Reapers are sort of his end game with that, and that can make him have some civil war, shall we say, with some Soul Blight Gravelord forces. And with that, guys, that's going to bring us towards the end of this video. So, this was like a summary, like I said, so can go more in depth into certain things if you'd like me to put in the comments down below but the next part we're going to have in this series now that we've covered the overall the law for the soul black grave lords is we're going to start looking at the rules and how i review the rules for soul black grave lords in this massive in-depth series like honestly it'll be somewhere between 10 to 20 hours like my other series if you have seen them as i mentioned at the start of this video what we're going to start with is if you had the book in your own hands and you're flicking it from the start to the finish so now we've done the law so the first half and then the first bit we're going to look at as part of the army series in the next video is going to be the actual rules for playing these really cool soul blight great lord forces like we've discussed in this video and the first bit of the rules is going to be looking at the allegiance abilities and then in the second video we'll look at the sub allegiances so the two legions we mentioned in this video and then the dynasties as well that are playable and then after that we'll start looking at the actual rules for the models and the units, the coolest part of the army, right, when it comes to gameplay in those future videos. So make sure to stick around for that if you do want to watch that and make sure on that note, smash that bell button because it means you'll never miss any one of those future videos. Like I said, we'll be incredibly in depth. So if there's like something you're thinking about in your head and you want to know what Nagash's own thoughts are on that rule from the Soulblood Gravelords, I will be covering it. Don't you worry, and like I said, in the meantime, you can go check out my Why Play Soul by Grave Lords video, and then also I did a quick, sort of, I say quick video, it's about three plus hours, talking about my initial reactions to the War Scrolls we saw for Soul by Grave Lords, but what I would say is you can check that out, but take that other pinch of salt, that video, because my thoughts on it might change a bit, because that was before 3rd edition came out, and that was sort of me looking straight from Legion of the Gash on Soul by Grave Lords, and obviously, that was um, probably a couple months ago, so there's been a lot of change since then to make me be able to give you guys a more sort of accurate and honest opinion on how I think these rules are now in 3rd edition. So you can go check out that video if you'd like to, but check out the new stuff as well because it will be more accurate. And with that guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think are really cool about the Soul Black Gravelords in, down below in the lore. And if you did enjoy the video, if you could please smash that like button, it massively helps the channel. If you could smash that subscribe button as well, it's how the channel grows. The bigger the channel gets, the better it gets at the end of the day. And like I said, smash the bell button so you won't miss any of future Soul Black Gravelords videos. And to be honest with you guys, it's nice to be going back to Soul Black Gravelords. And when I mean going back, I just mean going back to Legions of the Gash or back when I first started, 
Death Ground Alliance. That's how the channel started, looking at the Death Ground Alliance before Legion of Gash even came out, trying to make sense of what's the best way to use your like Death Rattle and everything else. So it's nice to sort of do a full circle and come back to it. So I'm personally very happy about this series that I'm doing it, especially after doing, I'm spending absolutely ages making this lore video for you guys. So it's really sort of um, boost my motivation, shall we say, and passion and ignited it again for the Soulblight Grave Lord. So I'm really excited. I hope you are too. And what I'd like to say as well, if you know anyone else who would enjoy this, make sure you share the video of them. If you want to be chatting about Soulblight Grave Lords, put it in the comments down below. But there's also a link to my Discord in the description of the video. Press that link. You'll be able to join a fantastic community where there's over, I think, 350 people in the Discord now, which is absolutely blown out of my mind of how incredible that is and um, the best thing is they're all lovely people we haven't got any pricks don't worry about that it's quite remarkable it being a thing on the internet but go join that amazing community like i say loads of talk on there about soul black grave lords and lots of other armies if you like to talking about the hobby side building painting playing tactics list building everything else it's all there and lore as well if you would like that and then I'd like to say as well is if you'd like to support the channel that step further, if you would please consider pressing the join button next to the subscribe button or there's a link to my page on the top of the description down below. And why am I asking you to do this? If you click either of those buttons, you can give something from at least one pound or one dollar a month straight towards the channel. And that's what keeps the channel going at the end of the day. YouTube essentially doesn't really, you know, pay and the amount of time and effort and money and stuff I've put into doing these YouTube videos to hopefully help you guys out with your hobby in Age of Sigma and especially, you know, in this video, you know, getting your um, Soul Blight Grave Lords going. It really helps if you can give back to the channel and support that way. Even if it's just like a dollar a month or something, it really um, goes towards me being able to do this. As if I didn't have anyone to support me this way, I honestly wouldn't be doing this channel. As it's, just, it's just not worth all the time and effort, if I'm completely honest with you. But when I see people being able to support me on a personal level, it shows to me that all the... Um, time and resource and effort like I say that I want to put into the channel uh, I can justify it as people are enjoying it that much so if you'd like to become one of those amazing people click the join button or the link to my patron down below that would be incredible I would let's just say I would love you for immortality with that I'd effectively give you a blood kiss if I could um, but with those people who made that amazing decision I'll read their names out now so firstly my vampire lord and zombie dragon who is Philco he is absolutely incredible, especially Vampire on Zombie Dragon, Soul Black Grave Lords. It fits the theme perfectly for this video. And in all honesty, though, he gives such a massive support to the channel. I really don't know what to say apart from giving him a shout out in every single one of these videos. And um, please keep up the great work, buddy. It's amazing um, how much it helps the channel. And then going on to my Morgos, who again give a really massive support to the channel. It's going to be Bleed Red, Necropolis and Edward P. Thank you all so much for your continued support to Asian Agash and keeping it going. It really means a lot and thank you so much for being really nice people. And then my core that keeps Asian Agash going as I always say. And in this video, it's very relevant, we've mentioned the name so many times, the word as it is, my vampires. So this is going to be Mir, Ben C, Rouse321, David A, Dragunitty, Ronnie H, Darren L, Spare Bear, Christopher H, Northdrop, Nathan F, Andrew G, Tom W, Wiggy Hooty and Nathan S. Thank you all so much for your very kind support you've given the channel there. And then of course my necromancers who are Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sargas, Wolf Nick, Michael W, Cranky Wombat, Tom M, Christopher C, Krista F, James S, Thomas B, Steve T, James T, Patrick F, JJ, R Christopher, Seption, Arnold G and Sean S. Thank you all so much for allowing me to keep this up and to help get people into our amazing community of Warhammer Age Sigma and to help them sort of develop and enjoy Warhammer Age Sigma as best they possibly can or the best I can try and help them with that in their journey of what is a awesome hobby. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much guys. And if anyone would like to become one of these amazing people, like I say, smash the join button or the link to the Patreon down below. I'd, be, I'd massively appreciate it if you could just have a look. That'd be great. Um, but if you can't do that, no worries at all. But all I do ask if you do enjoy the video, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, smash the bell button, and feel free to share it with someone. You know, they're all really free and they are absolutely super quick to do. You know, you can smash those three buttons in less than a second, I reckon. Try and challenge yourself. But with that aside, I'm massively, mostly happy that you just came and checked out this video today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something about the Soulblight Gravelords. I try to cover things in this video that's a little bit different and not just say, 
you know, the blood drinking vampires, move on, let's talk about the rules. I think it's really, really good to sort of break down the law for them, even a sort of summarized video, but the law section of this video went on for what, 30 plus minutes anyway, so that's a significant amount for just a summary. But anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember until next time to stay safe, stay hygienic, make sure you wear a mask, Unless you're sucking the blood out of someone's veins to maintain your immortality. That is an exception I'll give you. But afterwards, make sure you wash your hands because then it just means you're more lucky in your escape from the witch hunters at the end of the day. So make sure you do that. And remember until next time, as always, and in particular in this video, that Nagash is all, at all, is one in Nagash. <laughs>